For decades, Ontario's automobile industry provided good jobs and helped build strong, prosperous communities. But recent plant closures and competitive challenges abroad have led to speculation that the sector could soon be faced with the end of the road. Joining us now for more, here are Charlotte Yates, Director at McMaster University's Automotive Policy Research Center and Dean of Social Sciences at McMaster, Jim Stanford, economist with the trade union Unifor, Steve Rogers, President at GS Global Solutions and a past president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, and Faye Roberts, co-founder and principal at Scout Public Affairs. It's good to have all four of you around the table as we share, Mr. Director, if you would, the good news and the bad news about the auto industry in this province. Here we go. Shall we start with the good news? Ford adding 1,400 jobs with a new SUV in Oakville. That's good news. Chrysler investing $2 billion to retool the Windsor Assembly Plant in southwestern Ontario. Okay. Honda to invest $857 million to upgrade the facilities in Alliston. GM Canada to hire 100 engineers in Oshawa and adding 400 in Ingersoll. However, General Motors Canada is moving Camaro production from Oshawa to Michigan. Toyota is moving Corolla production from Cambridge to Mexico. Overall, automotive jobs in Canada below the pre-2009 levels. Before we dig into those numbers, let's ask how well, Faye, I'm going to start with you, how well do you think the auto industry as a sector has rebounded from the devastation that started in 2008? I think... Um, you were with GM at the time. I was. So if, just for full disclosure yeah. for people, I was with GM for about 18 years. Uh, so pretty f intimate familiarity with what happened in that time frame. And it was uh, pretty desperate and very difficult times. I would say um, the market certainly is doing very well. Sales are high. And you are seeing some of these investments and reinvestments in the facilities here. So I think we're, we have a lot of assets that we can build on and move forward for the future. Jim, how would you answer that? I agree. Uh, 2009 was a dark point, no doubt about it, uh, uh, a very desperate moment. Uh, since then, our production has uh, rebounded. We're assembling about 2.5 million vehicles a year. We're shipping $27 billion worth of parts. We've added 12,000 jobs in the auto industry since 2009. You don't hear that very often, hmm. about half in assembly, half in parts. So mm -hmm. as far as bouncing back and getting, you know, getting back to work in the facilities that we have here in Ontario today, I think we've done very well. Uh, the bigger issue is down the road, how are we going to keep those facilities modern, cutting edge, get the new investment uh, that we need? Hold That's off the longer that. run challenge. That is the discussion to come. Yeah. Steve, your view on how well the industry has bounced back since the downturn? No doubt about it. We're in a very good position right now. Most of the uh, automotive plants that we have here, most of the supplier facilities that are feeding those automotive plants are running at or near or above production capacity. Uh, so a great recovery. Uh, exactly as Jim says, the concern is the longer term and our numbers uh, going forward. Charlotte. Um, I suppose to add something new, I would say that there's been a lot of churning in the industry. So if you look what's happened, the number of plant closures in terms of auto parts, but yet still openings as well. So you get a lot of turnover in the industry. You see a real rebounding in consumer demand, but where those cars are being, bought, are being built is actually increasingly outside the borders of Canada. And so mm -hmm. while there are lots of signs, I think, of positive, there are also some worrying signs about what the place of Canada. The second thing I think we need to distinguish is the impact of 2008-9 was significantly greater on the Detroit 3 than it was on the Japanese. So Honda and Toyota are in a very different position now than I would argue GM, Ford, or Chrysler are. Different so, meaning better? Yes, they're in better. They have more cash. They are uh, leading the pack in terms of research and development. And certainly, they're the place where we've seen significant uh, investment in Canada. The only new automotive assembly plant, of course, was in Toyota. So again, a story of two sets of automobile companies, which uh, adds complexity to that story. Jim, is this sector in terms of its importance to the Ontario economy as important today as it was, say, 40 or 50 years ago when the auto pact first came in? Well, when the auto pack first came in, in 1965, our industry was very small, actually, and underperformed in terms of productivity. The auto pact, of course, ushered in a, a, a tremendous generational expansion uh, in the industry. That was a deal we had with the United States. We had free trade in vehicles and parts going both ways, but the companies had to keep a proportional share of their jobs here in Ontario, and it was magnificently successful uh, for us. Our industry kind of peaked in the late 90s, 
Uh, that's when, coincidentally, I suppose, the World Trade Organization actually overthrew the auto pact and said, no, it's against the new rules of global trade. And, and it's now a race for you know, whoever can be most competitive in terms of uh, uh, winning investment. Since then, the industry's shrunk a lot, but the plants that we have are still incredibly vital. They are an anchor for jobs, for income, for production uh, throughout the, the whole provincial economy. But not as big a chunk of the economy as it once was? Probably not, but what we have is still vitally important. For example, we just commissioned an independent study on the importance of General Motors operations in Oshawa. There's about 4,100 people there, uh, production and salaried, who work directly in the production there. Uh, the study showed that there's about 33,000 jobs in total that depend on the plant, $5 billion uh, in GDP, over a billion dollars a year in government revenue depends on that plant being there. So yes, we've got fewer plants than we used to, but every one of those plants is still a crown jewel, and uh, we've got to be focused laser-like on making sure they, they stay in operation here. Charlotte, how much of the bad news that we have heard lately mm -hmm. and that we shared with our viewers off the top, how much of that is as a result of the downturn? How much of that is as a result of other factors? Oh, I think there's a number of other factors at play. I mean, post-2008-9 has really been the period when Mexico has seen massive investment. Prior to that, really, Mexico had quite different patterns of investment than we're seeing now. Now we've seen, I think, eight new assembly plants, uh, billions of dollars of investment, and in different parts of Mexico as well, penetrating much more to the central part of Mexico. So that factor really is a game changer for Canada because it means that if you look at trade in terms of the kind of total trade balance in automotive export and imports to Canada, for the first time in 2007, we began to see a trade deficit. That's quite significant because it means we're importing more parts, more vehicles than we are producing or exporting. We actually got That's some, a worry. We got some numbers here that actually amplify on what you just said. So, Sheldon, why don't we bring these up right now? Here's the 2014 North American auto investment portfolio as expressed in U.S. dollars. In America, $10.5 billion. In Mexico, $7 billion. And as Charlotte just indicated, $3.6 billion in new assembly. Canada, there's $750 million, which is not chump change but compared to the other two, not as much. Canada now falls to third in North American output. We used to be number one. Canada's output share down to 14%, lowest level since 1987. And the trade deficit in 2014 with Mexico now up to $10.3 billion. Let's get into this. Why, uh, okay, Faye, to you first. Why, why is Mexico exploding? I think it gets back to consumer demand. Charlotte talked about consumer demand being at very high levels, so the companies are seeking ways to serve that demand. Really, the whole industry gets back to everyone seeking to build a vehicle that a customer will buy at the end of the day. And so I think Mexico has some advantages in terms of their labor cost. Um, but for us here in Canada, I don't think we should assume that that means we're not in a position to continue to compete. We looked at some of the numbers there, and we still are seeing reinvestments here in the facilities. And as Jim said, that's really where our focus has to be, maintaining those facilities, ensuring they continue to get investments for the future. But why the push to Mexico, do you think? Well, it's a combination of a number of factors. First, a very quick story. Volkswagen does the new Passat in a plant in Tennessee. It's a, they're about tenth in the competitiveness with that product, a great product, but uh, it's a very low cost, a very competitive product, and they don't have a lead. That's in the United States. The Q5, which is a premium crossover utility vehicle, uh, and where uh, they are, uh, have a premium price position, they decided to do that in Mexico. I asked the Volkswagen guys why. To me, this seems opposite. Do the Passat in Mexico, do the Q5 in the U.S.? Their answer was that Mexico has more free trade agreements. The Q5 is only built in one location worldwide, and because of the growth in South America, because of the growth in Central America, because of the growth in Mexico, they're only selling half a million vehicles in Mexico uh, 15 years ago, now they're selling 1.35 million. Just that alone, they had to put that vehicle in Mexico because of the access to the free trade agreements and where they could send it around the world. Uh, so it shows what Mexico has done on their economy. Mexico, when you go in there, when you deal with them, for state, local, civic, and federal, you only have to go to one location. On Honda's evaluation of where to put a plant, when they look at Ontario, it takes 13 steps to get a building permit. In Mexico, it's one step. How can it be 13 here? Well, just all of the different levels, because you've got to go civic, you've got to go provincial, 
Sometimes there's federal uh, emissions requirements, et cetera, but all of the factors that go into to get in effect to, to get set up. It's not that there's any less. There's probably still the exact same number of steps in Mexico, but they have an organization where they put a person in, uh, in position that says, oh, you got to deal with us. We will deal with all of the local civil. So they've really made it easy for a manufacturer to go in there and set up. Do we need to do something about that here? Well, and that's something certainly many people, including our Policy Research Center, have been advocating is that there is a need to streamline both government programs so that they're complementary to each other as opposed to sometimes they tend to conflict with one another in Canada. Hmm. What one ministry does and what another does makes it more complex for automotive uh, firms to uh, get the kind of support they need. Certainly there needs to be greater coordination across multiple levels of government. There needs to be, if I would suggest, a more strategic approach. In other words, instead of just reacting to an opportunity, strategic understanding. Where are the investments likely to go? How do we seamlessly move with three levels of government, including key stakeholders, um, to attract that investment? Because it requires an entire package. When uh, Steve talks about uh, the organizations in Mexico, it's not just things like building permits. It's everything from incentives from government, cash, land, it's uh, permits to build, it's uh, making sure there are the highways, the railways. All of that is, auto plants are so incredibly complex and demand an incredible infrastructure. If a government is able to provide that, and of course art, uh, artificially low labor costs in Mexico, it makes them competitive, but there are ways in which Canada can get into that game to make us more competitive in terms of attracting let investment. Me, let me hold off on the labor cost issue just for a second here, because I do want to ask the original question to you, which is why the U.S. and Mexico appear to be eating our lunch in the auto sector right now. What's your take on it? Well, I don't think the two can be lumped together. Against America, we've actually done better in the long run than America has at preserving our footprint and preserving our jobs. And on a cost basis, uh, right now with the dollar coming back down towards a, a more normal uh, historical level, we're, we're very appealing relative to the U.S. So there's no incentive to take production from Canada and put it in the U.S. for labor cost uh, reasons anymore. In fact, the incentive is, is the other way around. How about to Mexico? With Mexico, of course, it's a different story. Uh, you're dealing with a, a third world uh, country, and, and I think we can't be, we can't be naive about it. I mean, uh, sure, they've done some things well in Mexico, this one-stop shopping on investment. They've got very strong government supports and subsidies, but the core issue is absolutely labor costs. You've got Mexican workers who are not as productive as Canadians, but not that far off, making one-tenth as much as we do. And most importantly, it hasn't changed since NAFTA. The real wages in manufacturing in Mexico are no higher today than they were 20 years ago when NAFTA was signed. And a big piece of that is absolutely the suppression of trade union activity and political rights. We, we saw that horrible story last year of the 43 student protesters who were murdered uh, in, a, in a crime that had complicity with the local government and the local police. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So Mexican workers are producing a heck of a lot of wealth, but they aren't able to get a fair share of that wealth. And that's where I think Charlotte's point that there's an artificial uh, aspect to the cost advantage in Mexico. Ha we've, we've got to face up to that. Are any of the plants unionized in Mexico? Yes, there are. There are some that are unionized. Uh, in many cases, it's uh, a kind of a, uh, a government-affiliated union that hasn't really done the, the job. Not everywhere. The Volkswagen plant, the, the original Volkswagen plant, not the one making the, the Audi that Steve was talking about, but the original Volkswagen plant has a more independent union. But in general, a combination of political suppression and the, just the economic desperation that so many Mexicans face means that you, you don't have the ability to share in wealth like you would in a normal uh, a normal economic uh, situation. Even China, for example, has higher labor costs today than Mexico does, hmm. uh, which is startling when, when you think about it. And uh, sooner or later, I think in Canada, we've got to have a conversation about why that gap has emerged with Mexico and, and how we're going to address it long run. Fade, do you think that, um, I know what Jim's answer is going to be to this, so I'm not going to ask him, mm. but I don't know what your answer is going to be. Do you think that management and workers here at the Canadian automotive and automotive parts facilities are going to have to take a bit of a haircut in future in order to stay competitive with what Mexico's doing? I, the, the thing with, I mean, Jim said it well, labor costs are really important, but it's not the only thing. And we've talked a little bit about the process for getting investments and how companies work. And, and I hate to go back to this, but it really does come back to the customer. So if it's easier, it's faster, you know, we have skilled labor here, we can be very productive, which we are very high quality. 
it, the, the, the teeter-totter starts to shift back and forth. And, uh, but I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. It's not going to be easy. Uh, it's going to be really hard work, and I think everyone that's involved needs to look at themselves. I hate to say that because that's what Jim Prentice said, and he got in trouble. Um, <laughs> but we all have to look in our own span of control and find the ways to simplify the process. You know, is there ways that we can be more competitive? Can we be more innovative? Um, I think we have to own that ourselves, but it is possible. Steve, since Mexican workers are unlikely to be paid 10 times as much to make the situations more competitive, do our workers here, do our managers here have to make less money in order for us to stay competitive? I don't think it really is about making less money. I think Jim's point is very valid that again, even if you take a look at the total cost of labor in the, in the total cost of a vehicle, it's typically five, six percent. Uh, and so that is not an overriding factor and it's not just about competitiveness. There are a lot of other factors. Cost of land in Mexico is certainly much cheaper. When we talk Canada, we really mean Ontario and we really mean southwestern Ontario mm -hmm. because that's where all of our assembly plants are. Well, and, Alliston. Uh, Alliston. North of here, central Ontario. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, you still, when you take into account land costs of those sorts of factors, but to me, it's not about reducing wages. It's not about lowering the cost of living. We, we need to be competitive with where we are, but we need to focus on then what can we do to be successful. Innovation, when you take a look at the connected car, the autonomous car, all of the future technologies for lightweighting, that innovation isn't coming out of Mexico, it's coming here. Uh, and it's coming in the United States as well, but certainly Canada can be very competitive. So it's a question of focusing on those areas where we can produce products, where we have technology, where we have manufacturing. And still, even with assembly plants, it is about building the cars where you sell them. 66% of the Honda, of the uh, cars uh, Honda sells are built right here in uh, uh, Ontario, hmm. just because we know that they want to build those vehicles where they sell. So it's, it really is about focusing on the, the capabilities where we can be competitive. But one of the things, Charlotte, that we enjoyed was proximity to the American market. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. We're as close to the United exactly. States today as Absolutely. we've always been. So why isn't that the advantage it once was? Well, in part because even though uh, we think about automotive uh, systems as being regional ecosystems, if you will, they're no longer national, and so they are cross-border. Just as we're uh, kind of proximate to the American border, so are the Mexicans. And so as a result, what you see if you look at trade data, investment data, you look at uh, kind of movement of parts across borders, what you find is that Mexico has to some extent displaced Canada in terms of some of that central role. So they're playing a bigger role exporting parts to, uh, uh, to the US. So in a way, they crowd out some of the opportunities that Canadian uh, operations have had historically. What's different is that I think now you're starting to see a kind of recognition of a need to build a regional ecosystem around the Great Lakes region, which is uh, obviously southwestern Ontario, but also the various U.S. states. And with that, trying to find ways of improving synergies, uh, competitiveness, so that some of those advantages and that access to the American market is enhanced. But let's do a follow-up here, because I mean, uh, theoretically, southern Ontario, southwestern Ontario, is in wonderful proximity to the northeast of the United mm -hmm. States where the most number of people live and you know buy lots of cars. We're way closer to the northeast than Mexico is. So why aren't but, we getting the piece of the action we used but to? But what you're seeing is it's some of the some of the things that they're exporting Auto, automotive firms are always looking to make the, the cheapest that they can in the quality that they can to access the market they want. If in fact a part is made in Mexico, or parts in particular which are very light, easy to transport, just in time, low transportation costs, then in fact they may displace. Less likely, although uh, that their vehicles uh, will actually be transported, although far like, more likely that Volkswagen would come from there or Volvo from the southern US mm -hmm. than it would be from Europe or uh, from places elsewhere. So in a sense, that proximate argument really also has to be balanced out with cost factors and some of the disadvantages for Canada. Gotcha. If you, if you uh, look at a, how a company makes a decision on an investment, they've got this whole business model, you know, hundreds of lines of cost inputs. 
and some of the factors, like the transportation costs, as you mentioned, work in Canada's uh, favor. You know, so there's some some that work against us. The labor costs uh, are the big one versus Mexico. There's some that, that work for us. Some of the the other ones for us are the uh, quality and the productivity record in our plants are unmatched within North America. Our plants, on average, are about 10 percent more productive than U.S. assembly plants, 30 or 40 percent more productive than in Mexico. And we got OHIP. <laughs> we got uh, we got our public health care, which yeah. is actually worth quite a bit, about yeah. five bucks an hour for an auto assembly worker is what mm. the company saves because of our public Medicare. So you put all those things in, and especially where you've got a kind of uh, a foot on the ground already in the in the form of an assembly plant that's already here, you've got inertia on your side, you've got a number of things in the business case that look okay, we still have a fighting chance of putting together a, a competitive winning bid. And, and we've got enough success stories to prove that that's the case. Faye, let me follow up with government incentives because uh, I mean, the, the, be the biggest government incentive I ever saw was the government buying the company, right? I mean, General Motors and Chrysler were bailed out by Canadian and Ontario and American taxpayers. But are there other things that governments ought to be doing in terms of incentives to get the car companies to come here or stay here that they're now not doing? Well, all these jurisdictions we've talked about where investments are going as compared to here they are actively seeking these investments because they want what we have as Jim quite rightly pointed out um, so the government is definitely part of the picture and both Ontario and the federal government have proved themselves to be willing and very engaged and interested in the industry um, as far as things you know they both have programs they're actively seeking to engage with the companies and um, it, it's an important part of the puzzle. I think that the other piece is it's very difficult to get information about how those other jurisdictions are structuring their incentives. Um, but we do need to dig into that to make sure that the way that we're interacting with the companies is comparable or is meeting our needs and these other places don't have something that we don't have to Well, offer. that's what I want to ask. Steve, are there, uh, are there other jurisdictions that are paying to play better than we are? Yeah, I think so. Um, I do believe exactly what Faye has said, that our, both our provincial and federal governments understand the game, uh, and they really do and are willing to play and to support. Uh, it is very true, though, that if you go and uh, to Tennessee, South Carolina, and Mexico, they don't look at these as what we've sometimes called them in the past as corporate handouts. So they look at them as investments in the economy, that if we can get an assembly plant because of the spin-off effect that Jim talked about earlier, they really do calculations and they know that if they put five six hundred million and get that here the spin-off jobs etc the payback has typically been less than three years for the investment dollars they put on to an attract an assembly plant if you look at it in its heyday canada had 18 percent of nafta production simple math if you want 18 percent of nafta production you've got to win one out of every six new assembly plants that's introduced since the woodstock uh, facility that uh, charlotte referred to we're on an 0 for 18 run mm -hmm. Uh, and we've had some bad luck. But, you know, when it really came down to Volkswagen, the governor of Tennessee walked in and wrote a significant check right at the end, which they can do within their legislative capabilities, which the Premier of Ontario could not do in the same way. So we are handcuffed because of our Canadian morality, which I would honestly say is a very good thing. But there's no doubt uh, the governments get it, and they are. The AIF fund, the Automotive Innovation Fund, this $100 million fund that they've uh, just announced that was in the federal budget, the uh, so-called Automotive Supplier Innovation Program uh, to encourage the development of innovation in the areas where we can be competitive. They're trying hard to get us focused in the areas where we can be competitive going we do, forward. We do have the programs, but we could get more bang for the buck if we use the programs more efficiently. Uh, yep, Charlotte absolutely. mentioned the need for the one-stop shopping, you know, an integrated federal provincial effort instead of having Ottawa making their appeals and Ontario making their appeals do it together. We've also got to make sure the rules and, and practices around the programs make sense. For example, the federal government has this incredible situation where they give the company uh, an incentive for an investment, but then they treat the incentive like taxable income. So they give with one hand and take it back in tax payments with the other. And so we're the only jurisdiction. Which is rational. why Honda and Toyota are not that it's interested one of, in one those of the incentives because yeah. they do not need it. If you're, if you're a company that's losing money or if you're a company like GM and uh, that's struggling more, then it's worth going to the table. Ford, uh, I mean, we saw with Honda, 
Honda decided the federal incentive wasn't worth the hassle. So some of the programs are, are mm -hmm. irrational. Uh, the, the one that had us all shaking our heads was Export mm -hmm. Development Canada, the uh, federal export credit agency, actually loaned money to, to, to Volkswagen to support that new plant in, in Mexico and the expansion in Tennessee in hopes that we might get a little bit of trickle-down benefit for our parts supplies. Did we? Uh, well, we won't we know. We yeah. might get uh, some. We might get some benefit, we could talk about that, but why aren't we using export development money and every other tool that we have to get plants in Canada? That should be our, our you know, top Grant, focus. That was, that was a bit weird, eh, Steve? Yes and no. Uh, we really did. I was able to, out of that, I was able to get to lead Canadian delegations of parts suppliers to Germany, to Wolfsburg specifically. They've looked after us very, very nicely at the Wolfsburg Tech Show uh, every two years. We've led delegations down to Chattanooga. Uh, they've awarded close to $100 million worth of business to Canadian suppliers uh, directly out of that. Uh, so in fairness, I do think that there is a payoff. Uh, they've loaned money to uh, Tata in India. Uh, we actually uh, have opened up quite a number of opportunities for Canadian suppliers in India in that regard. Usually, so, usually factories that are in India. But the question oh, is, yeah. then, how do you the define case. what the benefits to Canada are? Uh -huh. Are they benefits to Canadian companies or are they benefits to Canada in terms of the community of Canada, in terms of through employment, investment in our communities? And that's where the differential is in terms of how do you define who's, who benefits from that kind of investment? Does anybody have a ballpark guess as to how much money we spend annually through, call them what you will, subsidies, investments, so, breaks, and so okay. on, to keep so, the auto industry here. Canada pays for every uh, investment, major, massive investment, the average is between 20 and 25 percent of the value of that investment is put together by the federal and provincial government. If you contrast that to the United States, where the average is between 50, uh, 35 and in one case, two places, 100 percent of the investment. So you're talking about not marginal differences, you're talking about huge differences. So you find, for example, the case of, that Steve was talking about, the Volkswagen uh, Chattanooga plant, 50% uh, incentive by governments. And that comes through free land, it comes through training subsidies, through cash, through tax incentives, through all kinds, the package is incredibly rich. What do we think, does it work out to like 30 grand per job or something like that? Well, I mean, and I'm trying to think, we've done the estimations of the job, mm -hmm. but the question is, if you think of a five-year return on that investment, mm -hmm. then in many cases, states will say it's worth it because if the jobs are better paying than the average job in that state, mm -hmm. as auto jobs are in Canada, you combine that with the tax revenue you get from auto workers, the investment into communities, the auto supply jobs, the spin-off jobs. The spin-off spin jobs the plant are... On average, there's about 10 absolutely. jobs in total for every so, assembly job. So. Well, well maybe the restaurants and the dry cleaners well, and exactly. around And there, they right? are making those calculations, yeah. and they're saying it's worth us putting that kind of money hmm. up front, and that's not been Canada's calculation. Not everybody thinks so. Hmm. And I'm now going to read something that Mr. Mike Moffat, whom I'm sure many of you know around this table, he's a wise guy at the uh, Ivy Business School at Western, here's him. We often hear that banks that are too big to fail or are too big or too risky to exist. The same clearly holds true for some automotive plants, which have gotten this size with the help of government handouts. But governments are not currently in a position to start saying no. The cost of high levels of structural unemployment is simply too high to allow automotive manufacturing to disappear overnight. Rather, a strategy for a controlled exit is needed, where government helps support existing workers while preventing a next generation of structural unemployment from emerging. Faye, yes or no? No. No? No. How come? Uh, well, with respect to Mr. Moffat. You don't have to respect him that much, it's okay. <laughs> I, I think for, for Canada to plan a controlled exit is giving up way too soon. And this is a high risk, high reward industry. And frankly, I think the people working in this industry in Canada are not prepared to let this go at all. And we've talked a lot about innovation here, but we haven't really dug into that part of the story and looking at the vehicle of the future, talked about connected car. There's huge upside for Canada there. And when you talk about kind of an ecosystem mm -hmm. for innovation, Everybody else mm -hmm. wants what we have here in Canada. We have world leading institutions, our academic, our universities are graduating talent that other companies, little places like Google, Microsoft, they're coming here and they're competing to have those graduates work for them. 
So we also have this opportunity to leverage that, and somebody has to design these systems that are going to go into the vehicle of the future. It should be asked. Okay, but Jim, let me put the argument out there, which is when the governments of Canada and Ontario and the states bailed out, or what, what, what word do you prefer to use? <laughs> bailed out. <laughs> bailed out. Bailed out is, is a good word. Word. Okay. <laughs> bailed out it GM is. and Chrysler, or invested in. And That's then a good one. Invested in, and invested then in, and then sold, sold out the shares. Quick yes, exactly. In order to balance the federal budget. <laughs> when they did that, let's let's say, and I don't know the exact number, maybe somebody here does, but let's say they spent probably 30, 40, 50 grand per job to save those jobs. If they'd taken that money and put it into something else, could you make the argument that that would have been a smarter investment, Jim? Well, if you can show that, then you probably should. Uh, but lots of economists have studied that very incident uh, of the rescue of GM and uh, Chrysler and, and said no, the return to the taxpayer was humongous. Uh, for example, the Institute uh, for Research on Public Policy, think tank based in Montreal, did an independent study of the, of the restructuring and said the cost to taxpayers of letting the two companies fail, not just the jobs in GM and Chrysler, but the whole spin-off sort of domino effect that would have occurred. Uh, would have been enormous. Taxpayers are far better off because the uh, government participated along with the Americans in keeping those companies going. Our view in Unifor was they should have kept going. It was very successful. Hold that ownership. Make it a long-run investment. Volkswagen, for example, we've talked about it, 20% owned by the state of uh, Lower Saxony in Germany, mm. where it's headquartered. And they, they don't just sit there passively own, owning 20% of the company. They use it as a tool to make sure that Volkswagen stays rooted in Germany. So Volkswagen hasn't closed a, an assembly plant in Germany since the end of the Second World War. But governments that want to balance their books love the idea of selling those shares and well, using that revenue against the bottom line. That's what happened to us, but I think that was very short-sighted. Uh, and so uh, the structural unemployment problem that, that Professor Moffat mentioned uh, doesn't exist solely because someone used to work in an auto plant and got laid off. The other piece of it is there's nothing else for them to do. And if there was a whole spontaneous eruption of other high-value, technology-intensive, export-oriented industries to employ Ontarians, then I would say he's absolutely right. But we don't see that right now. So if we want people working in that type of an industry, we've got to keep building the ones that we have. How many cars are made in Australia today? Huh. Close to zero. Close to zero. Okay, so you know where I'm going here. We have to figure out a way in this province to make sure that we don't turn into Australia. Mm -hmm. So let's get some strategies on the table right now. Steve, you want to start us off here? What do we do to make sure that this industry doesn't disappear and we turn into Australia? Well, first off, I, I would uh, suggest that we are not in the same position as, as Australia. Australia's car sales are very low. They don't have access to a 19 million unit market like we do, et cetera. So I think there are some significant differences. The big issue that we haven't really talked about, exchange rate when we were attracting all of the assembly plants, when we were doing all of the trade balance uh, positives, the Canadian dollar was at 65, 70 cents. Unfortunately, uh, unlike Japan that is only good at manufacturing, we're also good at taking things out of, the land, out of the ground, mining, we're good at agriculture, and we're good at manufacturing, but that means our dollar is affected by those other segments. So part of it is, and I do think it's encouraging now, that if you take a look at some of those uh, investments that had been made in Mexico, if our Canadian dollar was where it was today, it would have helped to make the decisions differently. But we are where we are. We're going to be we are, we 80, 80 some odd cent dollar as far as the eye can see. So that is a factor. So what we need to do, and again, uh, like I say, it is talking about attracting, looking at the, the OEMs will sell the vehicles. OEMs? The, the uh, companies like General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, the original equipment manufacturers, will uh, produce vehicles where they sell. We need more free trade agreements so that we can encourage uh, those companies to put global platforms in our country. Can I see if Jim would agree with that? More free trade agreements, Jim? Uh, the free trade agreements we've signed so far have hurt us more than they've helped us. I mean, it depends what kind of agreement. The Auto Pact was a free trade agreement, but with strings attached. More of a managed trade yeah, agreement. Yeah, and it worked trade. very well for us. With Mexico, it's, it's now producing that giant sucking sound that Ross Perot warned of. It didn't happen overnight, but 20 years later, that's exactly what we see. Uh, the latest one we've done is with Korea a country that exports three billion a year to us and buys almost nothing back and isn't going to under free trade. So that type of agreement doesn't help us. If it was a genuine trade agreement where they were going to buy high value stuff from us as well as sell it to us, then, then by all means. Would you agree that's what we need? I would, uh, again, I think we've got to take the longer term picture on that. The Koreans, when they want connected car technology, where do they run to? QNX in Ottawa. 
uh, for a lot of uh, that technology as an example. So I still think, again, you can't take a look at just the short term, you've got to take a look at the long term. We've got to continue to focus on that innovation. We've got to continue to focus on those areas of technological expertise, like I say, the autonomous car. We have an awful lot of very good assembly facilities. A lot of reason that we're losing product or that we've lost assembly plants, the Camaro was originally off the Zeta program, which would have been dedicated to Oshawa because of environmental regulations that all of the governments put in place. They had to rethink the program. They had to go with a global Epsilon program. And all of a sudden, uh, that is, you've got a plant with capacity in Lansing, and therefore it's a natural decision. Can it I isn't so much we lost it. Can I just understand that when you say environmental issues, you mean the, the Camaro the, belches too much pollution? No, well, the environmental issues that all of the Canada and the United States have signed up to that says we get down to 183 grams per mile of CO2 by okay. 2025. Take that into numbers that we understand. The average car sold in Canada in 2025 will get 4.7 liters per 100 kilometers. Hmm. Now, just take a look at that to where we are today uh, at a much higher number than that, probably closer to 10 liters per 100 kilometers on average fleet sales. It says that cars have got to get a lot more efficient. So a big rear wheel drive platform of what the Camaro was originally off of is no longer viable. They've got to go to a, a different platform hmm. uh, that allows them to do that. When that does, there's other plants that are also capable of building that same platform, CT6, Regal. We're losing those because there's capacity in other facilities. Not that they want to take it away from Canada, that we're not competitive. There happens to be competitive volume. Impala, 2019, goes to Hamtramck. Why? Because they will have capacity to produce it, hmm. and you always want to maximize the volume out of a single assembly plant. How do we make sure we're not Australia? I think we need to do a number of things, and I think governments in Canada are quite aware. It's just how fast we can move. I think we need to make a very clear commitment that there is money there for incentives. Uh, public support of industry is not new. It's not like, as uh, uh, Moffat said, it's as if it's suddenly a new thing. It's been going on for years, and it goes across the Western world, around the world, that governments need to support industry and do. So we need a clear signal on incentives. There needs to be a clear organization of that kind of bringing together of government support for industry around some shared tables to say, how do we coordinate across so that we're not conflicting with one another. That's uh, very important. We need to continue to invest in research and development because Canada has a relatively unique position in terms of both um, emerging technologies and fuel efficiencies, both lightweighting but also around some hybridization uh, processes. But then we also have the connected car. But those come out of both investments in R&D, uh, good public institutions like universities, so you need to encourage that kind of clustering of those innovation centers to keep being at the, for at the kind of forward edge. You need to start building relationships. I think sometimes that we backed away from this idea governments have important relationships to industry and have an ongoing dialogue about Advanced manufacturing is important to Canada. If it's important to Canada, what kind of dialogue do we need between industry and government to make sure that that advanced manufacturing platform is here and continues to be at the cutting edge of competitiveness? All of those are steps government can take and fairly readily without huge amounts of additional cost. Is there anything, Faye, that industry needs to do to make sure that that prediction of a disappearing in, um, auto sector in this province doesn't transpire? I think the relationship part is really important. It making sure that our government stakeholders and the supply chain and our, you know, the universities, which are the next generation supply chain, really for what we want to be doing here in Canada, understand where the industry is going and what the industry needs, so that there's very clear understanding of what is, what are the competitive factors, what can we do together, and I don't think any one stakeholder has to do everything, but everyone has to come. And, and talk together and make sure that they understand where the other party is coming from. It is the fact, though, Jim, that despite the fact that Ontario taxpayers help bail out these companies, there's nobody in a corporate boardroom saying, well, they did us a good turn back then, mm. so we should probably build our plant here to say thank you. Mm. That doesn't happen, does it? No, uh, and, and I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for that to happen. <laughs> uh, this is capitalism, uh, <laughs> after all. Um, I, more subtly, Steve, I think we often miss the idea of uh, champions within industry uh, to build the, the industry in, 
in Canada and in Ontario. You know, many of the leaders who come into business, especially in the uh, automakers, are uh, from other countries. Canada's kind of a way station on their career and they don't get the same sense of belonging. Uh, if you can get a Canadian champion like uh, Ray Tange at Toyota or I, I think uh, Steve Carlyle, the new leader at GM Canada who's Canadian, who really believes that uh, Canada's a, a good place to be and they can make a difference, some of those intangibles uh, can be very important. The man from Unifor gets the last word. Can I thank all of you for coming in today and helping us out with this discussion? Thank you. Charlotte Yates, McMaster University, but not for long. Where are you off to, Charlotte? University of Guelph. Good for you. You got a promotion. Yes. They're going to miss you in the hammer. I'm telling you, they are. Jim Stanford, the senior economist for Unifor. Steve Rogers, formerly with the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. Faye Roberts, formerly of GM, now Scout Public Affairs. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.